A few episodes back, I was editing the intro and was with me. And, and she was just like listening to like what I was doing. And she saw me cut out like two sentences from a conversation and paste that first half of one sentence with the second half of another sentence to like make a whole new sentence. And she was just like, oh, you do that? You deceive people like that? I was like, yeah. Oh, I do whatever I want. I do, do you, whatever I want. I listened. You, know, you you better fucking keep this part in the podcast because I'm going to listen. I, you, I swear to God, you edited an extra long pause after a joke I made. You edited like an uncomfortably long pause after a joke I made just to make it just more awkward. I swear to God. It's so much. Well, okay. I can't, I don't put extra, I don't put the pauses in, but if the pause is there, I might not leave it out if I think the comedic timing is nice. Yeah. God damn it. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. Whatever, okay, whatever so, it takes to make a good, good content. I'm, I do it for, for the, the most part. For the most part, what I do is I edit both of us to make us both sound more lucid, well-spoken, and on topic. That's comforting. Thank you. I've gone through an entire drink while we're sitting here. Let me let me just take my sweatshirt off, and then and then I'm ready to actually get into the episode. By all means. Welcome to We Read Theory, the podcast where we read theory so you don't have to. My name is Mark. My name is still Alex. And today we are going to be talking about one of the illustrious Marxist-Leninist leaders of the 20th century. One of the guys who was really at the forefront of the anti-colonial movement and when i say anti-colonial i don't just mean anti the direct colonial control associated with like the 19th century or the first half of the 20th century but also the neo-colonial control that took that that kind of succeeded the old colonial control in so many of these countries i was gonna say this person thomas sankara not to give anything away (laughs) not to spoil it not to let the cat out of the bag but was he from a specific country where he imposed the colonialism, their colonialism, or was just in general? So Thomas Sankara was born in a country in West Africa. It's a landlocked country that was, uh, at the time of his birth, called Upper Volta. And it was under French colonial control. In 1960, Upper Volta was released from direct French control, although, you know, we generally understand that that didn't necessarily mean that French influence was gone. The French were still highly influential and highly controlling in the economic sense and the cultural sense. He was a member of the military. And while he was attending officers training in Madagascar, he was witness to a number of popular uprisings in that country, and he was also introduced to the ideas of people like Karl Marx. He also came into contact with a guy named Blaise Compaore. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm going to keep saying it like that for the whole episode. And he's one of those guys that's just present at many of the most important um, moments in Thomas Sankara's life and death. While he was serving in the Upper Voltaic military, the country was plagued by a series of military coups. He would go on to hold the office of Minister of Information in the government of a man named Saye Zerbo, but he would later resign from that position due to political differences with Zerbo. He became prime minister some months after a coup that took Zerbo out of power, but then he was later ousted again in May of 1983, and then some months after that, he was actually arrested. So so Upper Volta is going crazy with coups. Things are happening. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going back and forth between various people that are trying to vie for power. In August of 1983... Blaise Compaore, that guy I talked about earlier, who was kind of in a group of communist officers 
uh, with Thomas Sankara and a few other people, organized and staged a coup that took the current president out of power, the guy that had succeeded Saye Zerbo, and uh, the result of this coup was that Sankara ended up as president of Upper Volta. That was in August, like I said. That seemed pretty easy. I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah, I know you're paraphrasing, it's, but damn. It's just one of the coups actually took and Thomas Sankara then became president. Yeah, it was, it was coup after coup after coup after coup. It was like half a dozen coups in like 20 years. It was, it was a crazy place to be. And yeah, about a year after that revolution that put Sankara in power, he changed the country's name to the name that it currently has today, which is Burkina Faso, which translates to land of upright people. And the denonym, the name for the people that live in Burkina Faso is Burkinabe, which translates to uncorruptible people. Uh, Sankara would serve as president of Burkina Faso until October of 1987, when he was assassinated while president. Uh, the assassination was once again organized by the same Blaise Compaore, and then Compaore becomes president, and he he plays the part of like that neoliberal post-communist reformer who cozies back up to the French, he cozies back up to the World Bank and the IMF, and in a period that is called the democratization period of Burkina Faso, he managed to stay in power for 27 whole years through a series of elections that are pretty much uniformly considered to be at least a little sketchy. And uh, he eventually was toppled and brought out of power in a popular uprising in Burkina Faso in 2014. So let's rewind, not all the way, but just a little bit, back to 1983, uh, the year that Thomas Sankara takes power. And the thing, the thing to remember about Thomas Sankara is that he often didn't like to call himself things like a socialist, a Marxist, a communist, because... On the one hand, this just makes it easier to interact with the rest of the world. It it doesn't sound as threatening to people. And at the same time, he really wanted people not to focus on labels and ideologies, but to focus on ideas and specific policies aimed at improving the well-being of the Burkinabe people. That's pretty fair. Like 70% of Americans love Medicare for all unless you call it Medicare. Yeah, or, or, or so many more people support the ACA than support Obamacare, even though they're two names for the same thing. Yeah, it's crazy. Wait, <laughs> what's your opinion on this whole super capitalism meme? Mark, honestly, I've removed myself from the internet a little bit. I haven't been okay. tweeting as much. Just, I don't know, trying to better my mental health a little bit. You're going to have to explain this one to me. All right, super capitalism is basically this meme that's been going around that's like, oh, you could convince everyone or like a lot of people that socialism is a good thing if you just call it super capitalism and you you kind of couch it in all these conservative pro-america terms oh like anti-foreign aid um we're gonna pool all of our money together to benefit america yeah yeah like oh uh business owners are like the backbone of the country so what if everyone in the business was a business owner blah 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 stuff like that um which I'm pretty critical of stuff like that. Gramsci actually talked about this, and we we kind of went over that in our episode on Gramsci about how where you try to trick people into agreeing with your policies without underst- without actually helping them to understand what they are, and you end up with people who might agree with you in an argument on the internet, but that's not really the important thing. The question is, are they showing up to protest? Are they going to work with people who are engaging in direct action? Are they going to vote the way you need them to vote? Uh, you know, are they going to get behind the figures you need them to get behind? And I don't know that a strategy like super capitalism is going to produce people like that. I think you need to be, I actually am with Thomas Sankara. I think that you should not worry so much about the labels and talk directly about policy and directly about ideas. And only after they've begun to like accept that the policy is good then you go, oh, well, you know, the label for that is actually this. If you believe this, then this is actually a reasonable label for you. You know, socialist is actually a reasonable thing to call yourself if that's what you believe. I think that's kind of when the labels are a good time to bring them up. 
Yeah. I'm not even sure. I guess, yeah, I guess I'm on your side. I don't think I'm, you know, it's kind of like, I feel like bringing up labels at the end is kind of like an I told you so. Yeah. Like, hey, you fucking idiot. You've been um, uh, shilling for socialism this whole time. You didn't even know it. Um, yeah. You, you could have been, had these great policies enacted long ago, but you were too stupid to realize it. Yeah. There's definitely like an advantage to having labels that are useful and mean things because it means that you can identify who is working towards the same goals as you right off the bat and that makes things like uh participating in the political sphere a lot easier because you can go oh well who else in 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 this organization is a socialist okay those are the people that want the same things as i do uh but <laughs> yeah as the labels but you know mean less you know with the leftism uh, someone can believe everything you do except for like one degree off. And then you're like, God, I hate this person. Yeah. Oh my God. My least favorite person. Exactly. You can, you know what I mean? So let's, let's look a little bit at what the revolution looks like in Burkina Faso. What was upper Volta at this point in time? Sankara outlined what he thought the revolution should be in his political orientation speech, which was given in October of 1983, a few months after the coup of August 1983. And one of the first things that you notice when you are reading through the kind of speeches of Thomas Sankara, I mostly worked from his speeches kind of throughout his presidency to get at where his head was at at various times. And one of the things he says right off the bat is that a lot of people are are mistaken in that they place Thomas Sankara, the individual, at the center of the revolution. And he thinks that's a really bad idea, because it, what it misses is the actual reasons why the revolution occurred. He, he, he's really, really trying to place the revolution in a dialectical framework, and he uses the word dialectical in his speeches. Uh, so he's very, very much working in that same Marxist-Leninist tradition where things are not necessarily inevitable, but where the seeds for what happens today are planted a long time ago and develop over time. And so to go, oh, well, it was Thomas Sankara asserting his will over the country kind of in an authoritarian uh, way misses the fact that he was able to do so because of a popular uprising that was happening as a result of the dialectical development, as a result of the colonial system unraveling and, and the country having to be decolonized, in, officially speaking, and then the new neo-colonial system also being inherently unstable. And these are really the factors that lead to the revolution happening. So the fact that they were kind of taking control from this neo-colonial regime kind of leads into this idea that at, at its core, the revolution in Burkina Faso and all popular revolutions around the world is fundamentally a struggle against the forces of colonialism and, by extension, all imperialism and the forces of class warfare, that, that exploitation of the masses by that smaller group of people, the bourgeoisie. Another thing that Sankara outlines in his political orientation is that the revolution is impossible without the emancipation of women, who he says suffer all of the same class antagonisms that working class men suffer, along with additional antagonisms of the sexist system on top of that. And finally, the revolutionary government that Sankara sets up is based on the principles of democratic centralism. That's a term that he uses directly. And democratic centralism refers to a system in which the power of the state is highly centralized, but distributed democratically through things like elections or local councils and stuff like that. In the context of Burkina Faso, those local councils are called CDRs, or Committees for the Defense of the Revolution. I was going to say, this. correct me if I'm wrong, but this sounds kind of similar to Abdullah Akalan. I noticed a lot of those same similarities, and, and I, think, I think you might uh, continue to see that a little bit. So what, what the CDRs did, they were local political bodies that combined a lot of responsibilities into one place. They oversaw labor organizing. They oversaw justice proceedings, and they even had an armed wing to them. So they they do, in many ways, serve the same basic functions as the communes that we talked about in democratic confederalism. They are also the main thing about Sankara's Burkina Faso 
that was um, that received kind of international criticism, and they, they were seen as uh, an arm of human rights abuses by by um, organizations like Freedom House and uh, Amnesty International. And the reason for that is that the way that the CDRs meted out justice seems really arbitrary because it wasn't on the basis of any kind of unified written law. And, 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 and later they set up what's called the People's Revolutionary Courts, which did kind of the same thing. And Sankara argues that the written law that previously existed in Burkina Faso was inherently biased towards the powerful. It was written to be biased towards the powerful, towards the wealthy, who could afford lawyers who were capable of interpreting the law. I think that's pretty fair criticism to make about the previous law. And this is kind of something that anarchists talk about too. Like, take Bookchin, for example. Bookchin's always talking about how important subjectivity is. And, And I kind of see some of that philosophy going on in these CDRs and in how they're doing justice where it's it's about getting the people together and if they feel that they've been wronged by you then you have to suffer some kind of a punishment for that but it's not necessarily you broke this specific law or anything like that and so a lot of international like uh NGOs see this as a as an infringement on civil rights at the same time you get a lot of people who might not have been punished for the things that they did ended up having to kind of give back money that they got through ill means that they might not have had to in a more traditional court system. Uh, Very very few people were actually killed as a result, uh, you know, executed as a result of the proceedings within the CDRs and later the People's Revolutionary Courts. But there was a lot of what seemed to be basically summary sentences. Um, So I, I think that there is kind of some space to be critical of that without saying that Sankara's government is more arbitrary and capricious or more authoritarian than any kind of colonial or neo-colonial regime that came before him. That's my opinion on the matter. What do you mean by summary sentences? Okay, so a a summary sentence or a summary execution or something like that. There are certain crimes where, say, a cop sees you that cop can be basically judge, jury, and executioner to you for that particular crime. If they see you doing it, they can decide to mete out punishment to you right there. So a summary execution would be if someone sees you doing something uh, who is entrusted with the power of the state, who sees you doing something that is a crime, they have the authority on their own to say, you are guilty of that crime, you deserve to be executed for it, and then they carry out the execution right then and there. That would be a summary execution. So that's kind of the style in which some of these sentences are carried out, mostly not executions, vast majority not executions. But Mm -hmm. that's kind of in ways the style in which some of these sentences were carried out. And there are upsides and downsides. The upside is that the people kind of have their voices heard in the courts. But of course, there's plenty of space for that to get really, really messy. So Burkina Faso, as as I've come to know it, is like a pretty small country, correct? It's a very small country. So these CDRs, they were how many, like, what was the ratio of CDR to townspeople? Because if it was like three people for an entire town of a thousand people, that's that's a lot, you know? Or if it's, um, I don't know, 50-50, that's maybe a little bit better and like less than, um, less authoritarian and more sort of what um ngos might call mob rule but yeah um, yeah so i i couldn't find exact numbers on like what percentage of the people were uh in the cdrs at any given time for the most part you could just join if you wanted to although there were regulations on who was allowed to join at different times at times if you had taken some kind of uh counter revolutionary action you might be barred from joining the cdr which once again, these are summary sentences. So, but wouldn't the CDR define what counter-revolutionary activity is? It would be up to the CDR. There you go. Ooh. And and you see you see that's how that's where it gets a little bit messy, right? Um I don't necessarily think that it's more tyrannical or worse or more violent than like the system that preceded it, 
but there's definitely space for things to get messy in there. Uh, it's really, really similar, actually, to when people talk about like the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror, which is a specific thing that the CDRs get compared to a lot. And in response to that, there's the famous quote, there are two reigns of terror, one that lasted a few months, one that lasted hundreds of years, one that took the lives of a few thousand, one that took the lines of countless millions, blah, 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 blah. One, one, that, one that has been documented and harangued over and over and over again, one that's been left to stew in silence pretty much always. Um, so I, I think at the very end of this, I do, I do want to talk a little bit about how I think we ought to assess and criticize the socialist leaders of the 20th century in a way that is fair and productive. Um, and, and I want to talk about different perspectives that you can take on it. Uh, but we'll get to that. Sankara also reorganized kind of how the military worked in Burkina Faso. He saw it as a matter of prime importance that the military be kept in very close contact to the people of the nation. And for this reasons, Members of the military would live amongst the people and would regularly engage in just normal people's labor, as well as their regular military action. He didn't spend a whole lot of money on the military because he was preoccupied with other projects, building infrastructure, vaccination projects, investing in increasing the literacy rate. In a speech in 1987, only a few months before he was assassinated, Thomas Sankara was in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, and he denounced military armament of African nations in general because he believed that the extreme power imbalance between Africa and the West meant that whatever weapons an African nation is buying are really just to be used on other African nations. They're not meaningfully going to be used to resist the West. And so it was better that they didn't really bother and that they spent their money on other things instead. And his, like, commitment to non-aggression, to de-armament, was really, really doubted all around the world. People said, he's stockpiling weapons, he's doing this, he's doing that, he's a warlord. But in 1985, he had a very short war with Mali. Mali is the country directly to the north of Burkina Faso. It was much friendlier with the French, they had French support. And Mali invaded Burkina Faso in late 1985 over a piece of land called the Agachar Strip. And this was, I mean, it, it, it wasn't like a majorly decisive defeat for Burkina Faso, but it, they also didn't perform super great. They did lose some, they ended up having to split that piece of land with Mali in the international agreement. But the fact that Burkina Faso didn't perform super well against a country like Mali, which is also one of the poorest nations in Africa, really goes to show on some level, I'm going to spin this, we're going to spin this, it really goes to show that he was actually really dedicated to that goal of disarmament. He didn't have a very strong military because he was spending that money on better things. And that, of course, leads into Thomas Sankara's commitment to a wider vision of pan-Africanism. He believed that African peoples all over the world, in Africa, as well as in diaspora, were the subjects of a particularly bad form of oppression, and so they needed to band together for communal defense. And he said this in South Africa, he said this in Ghana, he said this in Ethiopia, and he even said this in Harlem. He considered uh, the black population of the United States to be another colonized nation, the same as Burkina Faso itself. That's fair to say. Yeah. I, I think also... That, that's 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 so weird that um, losing a military conflict actually helped his, actually helped get his point across. Yeah, and even even though he like lost some of that, um, the land to Mali, it's it, it actually helped his message he's, in the long he, run. He's a master of spin. I'll give him that. I was reading his speeches and I was like, dude, you are so good <laughs> at 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 just like finding a way to be optimistic about failure and i i, I don't even mean yeah. that i'm like that sounds like i'm like kind of like giving up. but no I, I think that's actually a good thing and i think part of that um is is i think that dialectical materialism really feeds into that because when you understand history as a continuum of events where one thing leads to another the failures of today can be the thing that leads to successes down the line and they can become integral to those successes so 
let's take an example of losing a war one day, might actually be able to prove that you are committed to disarmament, and that may make people treat you with softer hands in the future and might give you a little bit more breathing room. Yeah, or maybe not expect you to contribute to um, a world war yeah. or anything like that, or a pan-African war or anything like that. Um, may let you remain neutral or something like that. I feel also in, um, this might be a bit of a tangent, but total military disarmament in um, socialist or otherwise um, ML, Marxist-Leninist nations. Right. I mean, don't you have to be able to defend yourself from imperialist or colonialist nations? I, I feel like total disarmament. I, I don't think he was. I don't think Sankara was advocating for total disarmament. No, I mean, and, and based on what you Burkina said, Burkina Faso did but, have a military. Yeah, you have to keep a standing military. And, There's no way everyone's just going to leave you the fuck yeah. alone. And ironically enough, he he did actually end up doing a little bit extra to the military after that war. It's called the Christmas War in Burkina Faso because it happened at the very end of the year. Um. I think it actually might have begun on or immediately after Christmas. Um, uh, They ended up with like a few jet planes and stuff like that. But uh, still, I mean, nothing really in comparison to... Do they have any... Side note, we can cut this out if it doesn't go anywhere. But do they have any like natural resources at all? Um, Burkina Faso mostly has been exporting uh, things like cotton and cattle. For, oh, okay. And they, Never mind that. Burkina Faso has been exporting cattle since before the French even came in and colonized it. Uh, but so if Russia gave them MIGs, new, uh, you, the United States wouldn't have really cared all that much. Yeah, we'll we'll get into their foreign relations. Um, if you if you want to like understand Thomas Sankara, the one of the big operative words and like what his philosophy was for running Burkina Faso, the big operative word is non-aligned are you familiar with the term like yeah like switzerland like neutral you kind of kind of or not aligned ideologically non-aligned refers uh is is a cold war specific term so in the cold war the war was the world was separated into three basic spheres there was the u.s and europe and their kind of sphere of influence and that was the first world often referred to the second world was the soviets and their direct sphere of influence and then there was a whole bunch of usually small not super powerful not super rich countries that were kind of in the middle that weren't directly aligned with either the us or the soviets and that's where burkina faso sits and thomas sankara is a really really big advocate for countries doing that he saw the non-aligned movement as how the world would win the class struggle, how they could end these giant wars that were killing so many people, they could reach disarmament and eventually world peace. And he saw the non-aligned movement as being defined more than anything else by a united struggle for liberty against the forces of colonialism. And when he talks about nations that are suffering under imperialism and colonialism, he doesn't just list countries like Grenada, which was, you know, having its government toppled by the United States, the CIA. He was also talking about Afghanistan, which was being occupied by the Soviet Union at that time in what was a Soviet imperial expedition. And um, yeah, I think I think it's really important uh, in our general understanding of the 20th century and socialism's role in it, that we recognize that a lot of the nations that come to mind weren't directly soviet allies although you know sometimes they might get some aid from the soviet union but they weren't directly soviet allies cuba it depends on which time period you're talking about but this is in the 1980s is is really one of those countries that's very big in the non-aligned movement as well the non-aligned movement is also famously uh included countries like yugoslavia under uh josip Broz tito egypt under nasser and in Sankara's time, what we're kind of seeing is like that second generation of the non-aligned movement in which the non-aligned movement is, is kind of feels a bit weakened. And uh, Sankara is one of the voices that's really, really trying to keep the non-aligned movement afloat because he sees it as so centrally important to how we get past this crazy ideological struggle that's tearing the world apart. But he's also 
ideologically speaking, very clearly working along Marxist lines and is very clearly trying to engage in a class struggle to liberate the working class of Burkina Faso, work with other countries that are doing the same things to hopefully liberate the working class of the entire world. And he sees the non-aligned movement as being allied with the working class of every single country in the world. Yeah, it's no surprise to me that a, a Marxist-Leninist um, who hates uh, labels probably isn't too fond of taking sides in the Cold War. Yeah. yeah, and it's also just very dangerous to do, especially for a small and poor country like Burkina Faso. And I just want to—I feel like we haven't— yeah, It's not profitable. Yeah, I, I, I do want to—I want to talk about some of the accomplishments that Sankara actually got done in Burkina Faso because they're really, really, really significant. So, so first of all, let's talk about women's rights for a second. In Burkina Faso, under Thomas Sankara, genital mutilation, forced marriage, and polygamy, these things were outlawed in the country. They hadn't been previously. Um, prostitution was also outlawed, which, you know, we're in like a very, we're in like a, an age where being a leftist generally means being pro-sex work. I think that's a good thing. Um, for the late 80s, I feel that's like a that bit, was pretty... Yeah, it's it's definitely... There, there, there's definitely a degree of social conservatism that goes into a lot of these like 20th century ML countries. Um, there was an absurd amount of rail and road infrastructure that linked the whole country together that was built under his rule. There was massive healthcare provision and vaccination campaigns... Uh, he was the first African leader to begin addressing the AIDS crisis. Uh, so, like, when we talk about how there are authoritarian aspects to Thomas Sankara's rule, we have to put them in the perspective that there's also authoritarian aspects to the rule of pretty much every state. And in most of these places, that authoritarian power isn't being used for stuff like this. So I think that's something to keep in mind. I generally think Thomas Sankara is pretty damn based, like, if we're going to be real here, because this is a guy who took a country that was a complete, like, we're talking 90% illiteracy rate, 90% poverty rate, uh, 90 plus percent poverty rate, actually. And he really went a long way to at least beginning to lay the groundwork for combating these problems. Of course, it's impossible to just solve these problems overnight. He was in power for five years before he got assassinated. And in that time, he did quite a bit, but he couldn't solve all these problems overnight. I do think that there is an interesting conflict that is revealed to be inherent in running a state that I think leftists need to contend with. And I think most leftists do contend with it, but I think we need to be reminded sometimes that when you talk about building infrastructure for people, when you talk about providing food for people, when you talk about providing health care for people, education, these things require resources and labor. That's just a fact. And people need to do that labor. And so there is an inherent conflict with the some of the things that laborers want, higher wages, you know, more leisure time in some cases, more control over their workplaces. And sometimes that is in conflict with things like providing health care, providing education, building infrastructure. And what we see in Thomas Sankara and Burkina Faso under his rule is that he kind of said, I don't really care so much about like the interests of labor. We have a lot of work to do. This country is hundreds of years in the hole as a result of incredible amounts of exploitation being done by the West. We can't just go, oh, we're going to like have this utopia, this paradise. We need to build. We need to build a ton, a shit ton. We need to build schools. We need to build roads. We need to build hospitals. And that means people need to work and people need to work a lot. And we don't have that much money right now. So people might not get paid as much as they want to do all that work. And I'm going to call you out and say that you are doing something wrong if you're taking that money that you do get from your work and you're spending it on luxury items like beer or gambling or whatever, because that's not what the country needs right now. And 
in some of the speeches, it does kind of sound like you're listening to a capitalist talk and talk about encouraging thrift for the poor and stuff like that. But at the same time, you need to pull back and look at the context and look at where the country is at right now. It's an incredibly difficult position right now. And it does require a lot of work to begin to get out of that foreign debt trap that it's in as a result, as a result of the neo-colonial system. And it needs a lot of work to get out of the incredible amounts of poverty that it's in. One of the ways in which this culminates is kind of later in Sankara's uh, presidency. I was just going to say before we move on, I, I I totally agree with that. It's not like a um, uh, after the revolution, a switch that you can flip. I was... um. I was talking with, I won't dox anyone here, um, <laughs> a friend's uh, grandparents. And the grandparents grew up in a, uh, a Soviet country. So so obviously they have uh, certain opinions about what it's like to grow up in a, a socialist country, you know. But um, I noticed that all of their complaints were not, my family members are are starving or my family members are dying in medical debt or um, cannot get treatment for whatever illness. It was, um, we have to uh, win a lottery to have uh, this government issued housing yeah. or something like that. It's not going to be the convenience you have of a capitalist society is not going to be the same in a socialist society, at least not in an immediate switch. Right. You, you realize like, like there's certain things that are in contradiction, right? We have, uh, hundreds of probably millions of homeless people out there right now, right? You can't uh, just house those people immediately. There's no infrastructure, even 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 though that we we have more than um, I would say like 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 double the amount of vacant homes in the U.S. to house those. I think it's people. five times. Sure, two, five times, whatever. We we they can't just be like like placed in them. Like you go here, you go there. Immediately, it it just it just doesn't work like that. You're gonna have like these people are concentrated in certain like urban areas. Yeah, That's and you just need how to have some works. extra housing because that gives people the freedom to move around, not just for pleasure, but also to get to where the work is. Exactly, and in and in um uh, my friend's grandparents, uh, socialist country, you couldn't renovate these homes at all. You couldn't do anything. They weren't they weren't yours, right? There there are these. Um, downsides if you're going to live like that or advocate for a society that promotes things like that. It's it's not um, it's not immediate. Yeah, it's not an immediate utopia like you were saying, like uh, the point you're trying to make. And people have this idea that there is, like, I feel like people often will often criticize socialists and and the results of their time spent ruling a country. Because it wasn't as luxurious as the U.S. And that always really frustrates me. Because there's this idea that like... Okay, take take a country like Cuba. You had the Batista regime, which was a U.S.-backed regime. Absolute nightmare. And then the socialists come to power. And there's two things that are true. The first thing that's true is that it's obviously much better than the Batista regime. In terms of literacy, homelessness, and uh, hunger? Yeah. Better. Yeah. In terms of just general quality, of, and, and and the government wasn't as tyrannical. I mean, the Batista regime was an absolute nightmare. But at the same time, there's also still a lot of problems that are, there are problems in the U.S. that are not present in Cuba, but there's also a lot of problems in Cuba that are not present in the U.S. Uh, with shortages of certain kinds of goods. But there's this idea that there is this option that's possible, that Cuba had the opportunity to be like the United States. And squandered it by turning to communism. And that really was never the case. Because, first of all, the, the, the U.S.'s wealth is built off of imperialism. So unless Cuba was going to get itself a whole bunch of colonies, it was never going to be that rich. At the same time, it wasn't going to be allowed to take that role, even if it could physically do so, because the United States would not have allowed that to happen. The United States, you know... Cuba already had its time doing the system that the United States wanted it to do, and that was Batista. And so I think that's a thing that we also have to keep in mind. We should be comparing socialist countries to 
what is the absolute best a country could be doing, period. That's how we work towards a better future. That's always the perspective that when you're arguing with, like, say, another leftist who believes in the project, but you want to figure out what exactly can we do? What is the best way that we can make people's lives better in this country? Then you, you do want to be comparing your system to the almighty. But in a practical sense, you also have to be honest and compare your country with the alternative because the alternative in Cuba and the alter the realistic alternatives in Cuba and the realistic alternatives in Burkina Faso were pretty much uniformly way worse. And, th and that kind of shows in the present today in that these revolutions are s incredibly popular in these countries. The Cuban revolution in Cuba is a very, people are happy that the Cuban revolution happened by and large in Cuba and in Burkina Faso. Um, you know, there was, under the presidency of Blaise Compaore, Thomas Sankara was, like, not really placed on very high of a pedestal, at least at first, but his popularity rose back up, and he was made a national hero after the ousting of Blaise Compaore because people loved him so much, and they were nostalgic for the days when they had a government that was concerned with the well-being of the people in ways that a neoliberal government, like, under Compaore, was not really interested in doing yeah <laughs> sorry do you have anything so, sorry no you just you just go on a you just go on a fucking locomotive train of a rant and i'm like yes 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 the whole time and then you're like what do you think and i'm like ditto <laughs> i i'm curious do you have any do you have any more questions uh because i i'm always worried that like it makes sense in my head and then to the listener, they're going to be like, what is this guy talking about? Are we doing the thing where Alex recaps what Mark talked about in a very poor fashion? You don't have to. No, I'm just curious. I just want to ask if there's anywhere where you feel like there could be a little bit of extra explanation. See if there's anything, uh, any last minute stuff I can add. No, I'll probably um, stay up late tonight doing a little bit of um, Wikipedia-ing about CDRs. Yeah, there's but, a um, lot. There's so much to talk about with the CDRs. It's 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 and really like how military service with or like not military service but the criminal justice system within each CDR and how you said they had armed wings which sounds a little authoritarian and cop-esque but based on what Thomas Sankara's whole vibe was about doesn't really doesn't really align. Yeah, I think that Sankara represents a really healthy even if you don't agree with the with the conclusions that he came to, which there are definitely places where I don't agree, he went to war with labor unions in a lot of ways. He did kind of like a Reagan thing. Reagan famously um, fired like a whole bunch of air traffic controllers when they went on strike during his presidency and just replaced all of them. And it's like one of those like great anti-labor actions of the American 20th century. And... Sankara does kind of have a parallel to that uh, when it comes to the teachers. He was really, really interested in attacking that 90% illiteracy rate, uh, which, like we said, requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of teachers doing a lot of work to make that happen. And the teachers were not happy about their labor conditions. And there was a big strike. And Sankara ended up firing and replacing 2,500 teachers just like that. And one of the results of that was that the people that he replaced him with weren't as well qualified. They weren't as well trained. They only got like 10 days of training in some circumstances. That's not great. I, I, but that, that's one of the places in which I, I maybe, maybe there is some way in which there could have been a better solution reached more of a compromise. I'm sure people, I'm sure teachers are interested in seeing the, the literacy rate fall, but that's a really complicated issue. I'm sure I could have a more nuanced opinion on it if I if I if I had done all of my research on this podcast on this one issue and really drilled down on it. Um, but it's there's so so many little factors that go into a decision like that. But all in all, I think that Sankara represents a a healthy and practical way of looking at working class pro working class reform in a formerly colonial nation where he is recognizing the difficulties he's recognizing the need to use power in the immediate sense and trying to figure out what is the best way that we can get our goals accomplished while 
trying to keep the country as democratic as possible, while trying to keep people as much freedom as possible. I think that Sankara went more towards the accomplishing economic goals sides of things than he did towards the democracy and freedom to a degree. I still think that he made great strides progressively towards democracy and freedom in this country. And of course, being vaccinated, being able to read, having the infrastructure to move around is a freedom in and of itself. Um, but I, I, I can, even where we disagree, I can look at Sankara and say, that's a guy who I, I, I have a hard time arguing that he wasn't totally committed to building the best life possible for the people of his country. And I think that's a really cool thing to see because you don't see that with leaders most of the time. Yeah, with I think maybe the thing you see with leaders uh, now more often than not is um, gaining political capital. And I, I have to I have to think maybe that when he was uh, firing all those teachers to improve the literacy rate, that was maybe him gaining a little bit of political capital, saying like, hey, I'm actually really trying to do something about this immediately right now. Yeah, it's definitely a bit of a power grab because uh, there's always some tug of war of power between the person who's telling the laborers what to do and the laborers themselves that actually do the work. And uh, that was really just like saying, no, I have the power. I say what goes. And if you don't do it, you don't have a job, which is kind of a ruthlessly capitalist way of doing it. But of course, it's not capitalist because it's not a capitalist mode of production, but... Yeah, it's, uh, potato, potato. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then, and then of course, you can always point to some of the difficulties being difficulties that were artificially placed on the country by just the legacy of colonialism, as well as the ongoing neo-colonialism through that imf world bank foreign debt trap cycle that uh we see as such a as a recurring pattern in so many of these former colonial nations yeah after um they freed themselves from french control i feel like this is a better example of things uh of a country just working on its own but everything definitely wasn't happening in a vacuum like you said yeah. with, uh, there was conflict with mali and stuff like that as well as um other african nations saying um, or at least spreading rumors that um, Sankara was stockpiling weapons and whatnot. Yeah. But um, it's about as good as you can hope for, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, I, I try to live in the same perspective that Sankara had, which was always a healthy optimism. He was a very optimistic guy. Uh, he was always talking about how, you know, people say this is a failure, this is a bad thing that happened, and I'm not going to deny that there are setbacks, that there have been difficulties, but we can always work harder and we can always strive more towards it. And the failures of today can become the successes of tomorrow if we use them as opportunities to learn and to change and to improve. Yeah, I feel like especially for the leader. A, the leader of a whole mm -hmm. ass country he was a lot more um he was a lot less of a nihilist than um leftists who are on their own in their apartments which is incredibly admirable yeah for for yeah. anybody i get down in the dumps if i was yeah. him but how could you not good for good for good for tommy boy yeah it's really really frustrating to read about uh, a person like this and then having the last thing in like that legacy of their life being that they were assassinated and gone before they had uh kind of finished with their time affecting the world and that's really really sad to see what details do we know about the assassination the assassination um so what we know on some level is that specifically the reasons outlined by Campeore for for organizing the assassination was that specifically the fact that relations between Burkina Faso and France and Burkina Faso and uh, Cote d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast, uh, which yeah. is another West African nation that had a that has uh, a particularly close relationship with France, which also used to colonially control directly uh, that nation as well. And, uh, you know, relations between Burkina Faso and France and Ivory Coast were kind of deteriorating at this time and so Campeore seizes power um he sends a group of gunmen after Sankara uh they they kind of jump him in a meeting they put a bunch of bullets in his back uh they shoot all over the place they kill 12 other people 
uh, who are like aides to uh, the Sankara administration. Um, Sankara's body is very quickly uh, gotten out of there and dumped in an unmarked grave. They recovered some remains more recently in like the 21st century that they are believed to be the remains of Sankara, but we're not a hun- we can't be a hundred percent sure. Um, so yeah, there was very much a desire to get him out and almost like erase him as quickly as possible to, I think that there was a, an idea that they didn't want to martyr him, which was of course an impossible task to not martyr him, uh, when you kill him. <laughs> <laughs> That's not funny. I'm sorry for laughing. And and yeah, and then the dude that that takes power, Campeore himself, ends up uh ruling for 27 years and it is a period, you know, it's a period in which the things like the GDP of the country do go up a lot in this period. The GDP of the country was also going up under under Sankara. It takes a little bit of a dip in like the early 90s right after he uh is killed. And then, you know, it kind of continues to go up for a while. It's been steadily increasing, but very slowly for a really long time. But the inequality in the country is still incredibly high. And so what little economic growth there is in the country is really, really not widely appreciated. Uh, Things like literacy rates have gone up in the past uh, 40 years or so since Sankara's death. I feel like any leftist who does their homework knows that um, the GDP is not a sole indicator of welfare of everyone in the country. It's an Um, indirect indicator at best. It, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I I would, I I don't think I'd say that like conclusively, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it can't be taken to be. an indicator of of welfare in the country. I feel like I'm I'm, I'm going to go super general in this. Yeah, it, it does. It doesn't mean pe- people living in shacks don't have four hundred one ks. The GDP means diddly squat for them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but <laughs> at the same time, um, killing the the I'm assuming democratic democratically elected leader. I don't believe Sankara was ever actually elected president because the terms for president in in Burkina Faso, are, I think, are seven years long. And he was only president for five before he got killed. And he was okay. placed in that role. Widely popular, can I say? He was widely popular. He was widely popular. A widely popular, killing the widely popular president in favor of repairing ties with the nation that colonized your home nation in favor of increasing the GDP is probably the most neoliberal thing I've ever heard in my entire life. I'll admit that I, I didn't I didn't look that hard into uh, the authoritarianism of the Campeore administration because I really wanted to focus on Sankara. And I and we appreciate that. We're only here. We're only concerned about the legacies of the leftists, not their yeah. not their killers. True. And that's it. That's it, basically. That's the long and short. Do you have any? Do you have any final thoughts? Final thoughts? No. Uh, final thoughts is uh, I hope twenty twenty one. Uh, bring some sort of social interaction. That's it. Yeah. That's it. I just want to vibe with the homies again. That's it. <laughs> I hope. I hope twenty twenty one brings a broad increase in political consciousness. I hope that people begin to see who it is on the political stage that's really fighting for them, not just in the halls of government, but also on the streets. I hope that in what will almost certainly be the next series of major protests that are definitely happening if not 2021 then 2022 2023 i I think we're going to get something even bigger than the george floyd uprising that we saw in 2020 and hopefully the fact that it's bigger assuming that's the case also correlates with the fact that a higher percentage of the people believe that this is a movement that has their best interests at heart um and so that's what that's what i'm really hoping for and i think that the i think that the ground is set for that i think the biden administration is going to really really piss people off but it's up to those of us who are listening to this podcast to get people who are under the impression that the biden administration is going to breathe new life into the country and bring things back to the version of normal that never really existed under Clinton, Bush, and Obama, but that people kind of felt existed. And ultimately, it's up to us to agitate and get people to understand 
that that's not happening. And we need to just use the material conditions that are in front of us and align them with how people are feeling. Yeah. And in terms of material conditions, just uh, uh, revolution by the numbers, millions of Americans are past or at risk for um, eviction eviction or foreclosure on their home. So it's essentially homelessness uh, within the next couple of months. So at the end of every month, it's 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 just stockpiling it's going to be more and more and, yeah and 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 as the as and the moratoriums didn't stop rent so so no the moratoriums though, didn't even fucking exist no they weren't they weren't enforced they were basically yeah well they the opposite was enforced especially in places like you know yeah Portland, there were the, more eviction proceedings in certain places than before the moratoriums were implemented Weird, yeah. Weird how weird, weird how things that benefited um, middle class and lower class Americans weren't actually enforced by police. That's 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 crazy, bro. Dude, Bernie Sanders has been a Mitch McConnell reply guy for the past two weeks on Twitter, and I love it. <laughs> Bernie Sanders pop um, comedy is uh, drastically saving my mental health. Um, and also, just an important thing to consider that uh, the wealth gap that we have in the United States is greater than the wealth gap that um, uh, spurred on the French Revolution. And and the uh, and the ousting of Mubarak in Egypt in 2011 as well. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. Crazy how that works. Just some food for thought, guys. Just some food for thought. Um. You can follow us on Twitter and Reddit <laughs> and Reddit at uh, We Read Theory Pod on both Twitter and Reddit. Yeah. And if you want to listen to this episode on YouTube, I'll be uploading it on YouTube as soon as I as soon as I get the audio for it, as soon as I can. And you can also listen to this on literally any any uh, little podcast hosting site you wish okay uh all all that permitting uh we thank you for listening we love you and if i personally don't see you good afternoon good evening and good night